Good evening, everyone. I'm Melissa Muscatine, co-owner of Politics and Prose, and along with my husband and co-owner, Brad Graham, we welcome you to tonight's edition of PNP Live, which is going to be fabulous. I'm so glad all of you are uh, able to join in. Um, if you have a question for uh, one of our guests tonight and uh, could look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little tab or icon that says, ask a question. Please click on that to ask, uh, ask a question if you have one. That's gonna be the easiest method for us to get the questions to our guests and get them answered for you. You'll also see a chat column on your right, which you can participate in obviously, uh, but most importantly, please find a link to Paul's book. Uh, you can click on that link and purchase it. Of course, you're gonna to wanna to purchase it for yourself and all of your relatives and your neighbors and friends uh, because there's a lot riding on what he says. So uh, please go ahead and, and purchase Paul's book and, and help support uh, this discourse that he's, um, he's, he's lending to all of us uh, in the next few months and beyond. Um, I just wanna say that uh, any night of the week, we'd be thrilled to have either one of our guests for a PNP event, but getting them together is kind of like a hallelujah moment for us at PNP. Uh, I don't know how many of you are counting or have that little thing that shows the days, minutes, and seconds till the election, but if you're not counting, there are 88 days remaining. Personally, I kind of wish the election was today, but we have to wait 88 days. Um, and, and as I said, given what's riding on the outcome, uh, it's just such an honor and pleasure to introduce uh, my old friend and former colleague, Paul Begala, uh, for tonight's event. He is gonna tell us how Democrats can win in November. That would, of course, if we're successful, mean ridding America of at least one of the two plagues currently ravaging our nation. Um, Paul will be explaining all this by uh, talking about his new book. It's called You're Fired, The Perfect Guide to Beating Donald Trump. Now, when you read it, you will encounter some of uh, Paul's choicest thoughts about the Electoral yeah. College, how Democrats can avoid what he calls the Trump trap and keeping one's eye, most importantly, on the concerns of voters and not getting sidetracked by, you know, the other big giant elephant in the room, literally in every other way. Um, so why should we listen to Paul? Uh, Paul is one of the most respected political consultants and commentators on the planet. He was chief strategist, one of the main architects for the successful Clinton presidential campaign in 1992. He then served as counselor to the president in the White House. That's where I had the uh, wonderful good fortune of being able to work with him. He helped run a super PAC that was instrumental in reelecting Barack Obama in 2012. He has written six books. This new book is his sixth book. Um, as I said, he's a commentator. You've probably seen him on CNN. And he also teaches public policy at Georgetown. And most importantly, somehow he has made it through decades in the hard boiled world of politics with his sense of humor his optimistic and cheerful spirit, and most importantly, his personal integrity fully intact. And that is no small feat. And thank you, Paul, for reminding us that it is still possible to, to be the person that you are in the political world. Gosh, thank you. Um, now, if you look at the back of cover of Paul's book, once you get it, or maybe you already have it, you will see blurbs. Here's the front. You can see it behind Paul also. <laughs> yeah. Here's the back. And you'll see blurbs from Bill Clinton, Nancy Pelosi, James Carville, even Willie Nelson, but the most flattering blurb comes from someone else. And here is what Donald Trump says about Paul. Paul Begala, the dopey at CNN flunky and head of the pro Hillary Clinton super PAC has knowingly committed fraud in his first ad against me. Uh, Paul, <laughs> clearly you are getting under the man's skin. Well done. May all Democratic candidates and voters and other Republicans who are never Trumpers read your book and heed your wise counsel in the next 88 days. Um, Paul's conversation partner tonight is the incomparable and incredible Donna Brazil, uh, currently a Fox News contributor and former interim chair of the Democratic National Committee. Donna was the first African-American woman to serve as the manager of a major party presidential campaign. She ran um, former Vice President Al Gore's campaign in 2000. She's the author of some really great books and bestsellers, co-author most recently of a wonderful, terrific book for colored girls who've considered politics. That book won the 2019 NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Literary Work in the Nonfiction uh, category. Uh, like Paul, Donna is widely respected for her political acumen as a strategist and communicator and commentator. We are just so darn lucky to have both of them with us tonight. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Donna, for being with us. Um, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. And uh, let me say uh, thank you to Politics and Prose, my favorite neighborhood uh, yeah. bookstore. 
and I look forward to uh, browsing uh, in the store and getting a cup of coffee as soon as possible. Paul, hey, how are you, my friend? I'm great. I miss you. I love seeing you virtually. I wish I could see you in person. Well, you know, if, if we were together, we'd probably be chewing on something and drinking something cold. <laughs> Amen. So, Paul, you know, I, I read a lot of books and uh, often I, I read the first couple of pages and, and put it away. But the thing that grabbed me about this book and the reason why I think people should read it is that you not only tell us the problems, but you also tell us how Democrats should run in 2020. Um, let me start by asking you one question. What went wrong in 2016? Wow. Well, first, like you, Hillary got more votes than the other guy, which, right. you know, in a real democracy would matter, right? It, 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 it only happened, I think, four or five times in the previous 200 years, and then it's happened twice in the last 20, uh, where, where Vice President Gore, under your leadership, won the election fair and square, uh, as did Hillary. But a, a lot. It was almost a black swan. You know, you, you had, uh, so, so the, for example, the left in our party was so convinced she was going to win, I think they felt comfortable casting a uh, a protest vote. So the third and fourth party candidates, Dr. Jill Stein and, and uh, uh, Governor Gary Johnson did better than usually third and fourth parties do. Uh, second, you had unprecedented invasion, a foreign invasion, it, foreign intelligence. Like I need to tell you, you were running the party when this was happening. They hacked us uh, and they manipulated us and, they, and the, the media went for it. The press covered Hillary's emails more than every other story about Trump combined. Uh, so that, that was the second thing. Third, you had this really obscene uh, act by the then FBI director, who's supposed to be nonpartisan, weighing in, personally attacking the, the Democratic candidate for president. First in July, when he cleared her of criminal wrongdoing, he attacked her anyway. And then 11 days before the election, that's what finally did it. Now, here's what I got wrong, though. I, I play, I, did that, that's all true. She, I, I could have done more and I could have done better. As Lissa said, I was helping the pro-Hillary super PAC. We had all the money in the world, and we we were running against just a really awful person, right? He says racist things. He says misogynistic things, Islamophobic things, anti-gay things. He mocked a POW, Senator McCain. He insulted a, a man's disability, Serge Kovaleski, the New York Times. I got distracted by that. I focused on his character, which is abysmal. I don't excuse it, but it was sort of necessary but not sufficient. You know, the presidency is still just a job interview and somebody's a horrible person, but maybe they can do a really good job. Right. I didn't connect it up to the, the, the retiree in Pennsylvania or the office worker in Michigan or the farmer in Wisconsin and tell them how their life would be worse. And I tell the story in the book. It's absolutely true. About three weeks after the election. And I'm not kidding. This was probably like Gore. It was the hardest election and post-election I've ever gone through. And list is right, I'm generally a happy person. I was miserable. I always, my, my joke was I sleep like a baby. I wake up every two hours crying and piss the bed. Yeah. So one night, honestly, I woke up and I told my wife, who is an army brat, but her family are dairy farmers in Wisconsin. I said, I figured it out. I figured it out. We ran these ads in Wisconsin about how Trump is, talks about women and, and people of color and veterans and POWs. And they saw that. And that, that, that wife, Ethel, turned to Harold, and she's like, well, you know, Harold, we can't vote for a man like that because they're decent Midwestern all-American families. Right. And Harold said, well, you're right, we can't. But about three days before the election, Harold turns back to Ethel and says, you know, Ethel, he's not going to grab you by the privates, but he says he's going to open up that factory where they laid off our son Harvey. So mm -hmm. maybe it's worth a shot. So I didn't connect it up to Harvey's life to Ethel's life, to Harold's life. I simply left it at he's a horrible person, which he is. So I don't want Democrats to do that again. Not to excuse Trump's bad behavior, not to excuse his abysmal, appalling, sewer level character, but to make it about voters, not about Trump. See, this is the Trump trap that Lisa referred to. Every narcissist wants the conversation to be about himself. And what, what, what I failed to do, what I want Democrats to do now is turn the camera away from Trump and back to that farm family. You know, I, I note this in the, the, the reason Willie blurbed it is I wrote a whole chapter about rural America and I sent it to him right. and he loved it. And that meant a lot to me because nobody's fought harder for family farmers than Willie Nelson. But we've got to reconnect with folks. And, and, and instead of simply telling them, hey, Trump's a pig, I think now after four years, people are like, yeah, I know that. That's news from nowhere. Right. But how does it affect me? So look, 88 days, 
And uh, you write in the book that Trump would like to make this about him, but we need to make it about the voters, the Trump track, as you just mentioned. With COVID still a major issue in the news, can the Democrats learn anything from 2016 and really focus on those issues that matter and not continue to focus on Donald Trump? I hope, I hope, but you're right. COVID changes everything. I think this is the first political strategy book written since COVID. You know, I did, I did two things. I, I grew a beard and I wrote a book. And I think it's the lighting in here, Donna. You knew me. Donna and I have to yeah, show I'm we checking go back. out that gray, man. I, we, I have it all over. But look at this, I'm baby. We go out. back 33 years we've been yeah. friends. 33 yeah, years. Yeah, part two. So thing. I, I, I wrote it during COVID. And it's more important now. You know, it, it is, as, as Stacey Abrams has said and many others, vote as if your life depends on it because it does. It really does. Um, you know, politics is not any longer what I said uh, when I called it show business for ugly people. It's a real thing. It's your life. And today, there's a good example. Today, Donald Trump goes out and says, hey, maybe I'll give my convention speech from the White House. Right. And we all get our panties in a wad. Oh, it's a violation of the Hatch Act. It is. It's criminal. It's, it's appalling. But it has no effect on Harold Nethel's life back in Wisconsin. So I think what the Democrats ought to say is, well, no, he shouldn't give it at the White House. With 160,000 dead, he should give it at a COVID ward. He should give it at an ICU. He should give it at a morgue. He should give it at a cemetery, because that's really embodies his presidency far more than the White House. In other words, get it back to people's lives. And it's hard to do because he, he distracts us. I mean, all good people are raised when they hear something that's misogynistic or racist to say, whoa, whoa, cut that out. But I think he uses that division as diversion to take us off the fact that people are dying before their time on his watch. But in the book, you, you say, are you right, that diversion is Trump's superpower? Mm -hmm. What's our crypt kryptonite? It's, well, God help us, COVID makes it a lot less effective. But it's also turning the camera back. And, and uh, I love them anyway, but I went and really studied Barack Obama and Bill Clinton, both of whom were subjected to terrible personal attacks. And in each case, they refused to rise to the bait. You know, Barack Obama, it took him months, years before he released his uh, uh, birth certificate, not because he wasn't born in Honolulu, but because he knew it was a trap, that they were simply trying to steal the election away from the health care and jobs and the issues he was running on. And he explained that, I think, very well. He would hold up that attack. This is the kryptonite. You hold it up and you say, now, why is Trump saying this? In Joe's case, he's going to come after his son. We know that. Right. So why why is he attacking my family? Because he hadn't done anything for your family. And believe me, win or lose, my family's going to be just fine. The question is, will your family be just fine? So if he if he allows you to be diverted thinking about my son, who's a fine man. Don't fall for it. Keep the focus on your son, your daughter, your granddaughter. You know, I, I think that's the way to do this. And again, I say this only because I failed to do it the last time. And President Clinton was nice enough to read the book, and, and uh, he did. He reminded me that was his first law of politics. Politics is always about people, not about us. In, in 2018, you write in the book um, that the Democrats were able to flip 41 House seats yeah. that Trump won in 2016. How did Democrats do that? Well, if there's a hero of the book, if there's a, a, a goat, it's me, uh, in terms of screwing up last time. If there's a hero, it's Nancy Pelosi. Oh, my God, I love that woman. And all again, all the big shots, everybody's, oh, she's terrible. She's terrible. No, ho, ho, ho. You know, she led us out of the wilderness. And what she did was so smart. She began with recruitment. And her recruitment began with diversity. And again, our, our Republican, our right wing friends, and we both have a lot of them. And yes. I think it's a blessing. They think our commitment to diversity is about kumbaya, touchy, feely weakness. It's not. It's about bringing in the best team. When you expand the talent pool, you get more talent. Right. Nancy knew that from the jump. She recruited more women and people of color than Democrats have ever put on the field before, ever, and recruited people with national security backgrounds, intelligence backgrounds, defense backgrounds, really cool, interesting, diverse backgrounds, as well as diverse uh, uh, genders and, 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 and race. So th that was the first thing is recruit diverse. She also, you know, Barbara Mikulski used to say this. She was a social worker before she was a senator. And she said this to me once. She said, in social work, they say, meet people where they live. Right. Right. And she met people where they live. She didn't run. She, you know, AOC ran in AOC's district. AOC didn't run in Colin Allred's district. 
right? So Colin is a former NFL football player, civil rights lawyer. He's an African-American man who represents George W. Bush's rich white Texas district. That's mm. terrific. That's terrific. So, and he did it not, he didn't campaign on Mueller and impeachment. He campaigned on healthcare and prescription drugs. And so, so diversity first, matching the districts, moderates ran in moderate districts, progressives ran in progressive districts. She funded them and did all the nuts and bolts right too. Uh, and, and, and that to me was all the most, uh, it, it became a tidal wave, but she didn't make it about Trump. You know, mm -hmm. in, in 2010, they all ran ads at work too. They all ran ads attacking President Obama and Republicans took the house. Democrats didn't do that. They ran ads about you. They ran ads about healthcare, about prescription drugs. And even though Trump was not popular, they actually got elected with a mandate for change instead of just hating on Trump. So I, I just think she's a genius. Uh, one thing, Paul, you and I both noticed that we constantly argue about uh, targeting the white working class uh, versus mobilizing the base. In the book, you address both of these issues and you also talk about the rise of the American electorate. Why is, it why is it so important that we get it right this time? Because as you did as party chair and campaign manager, you have to do both. You have to do both. You know, uh, uh, I think, Donna, it was Reverend Jackson who first told me this about how a plane has to have a left wing and a right wing. That was Reverend Jackson. Or it won't fly, right? Yeah. And I, I've had many an argument with Reverend Jackson, but he's inarguably correct about that. And that's what our party needs. You know, uh, uh, these primaries this week were these dynamic, impressive, this Cori Bush, I didn't know anything about her. And I watched her uh, interviews after the upset election against uh, uh, William Lacey Clay. Gosh, she is amazing. And my view is the party needs new blood. I don't really care if it comes from the left ventricle or the right ventricle. We get new, fresh blood, but we have to do both. We have to energize people of color, young people, women, especially unmarried women. That's the rising American electorate. But we also need to reach out to people who are in pain and turn to Donald Trump because they wanted a wrecking ball because they didn't feel like we represented him anymore. We can't get all of them. We don't have to. We just have to lose a little less. You know, if we can get back to the white working class vote levels that we had with Barack Obama, not even Bill Clinton, just do as well as Obama did, Joe will win big. And it's because the, the truth is, I looked this up. We lost, not just COVID, 160,000. We, we've lost 71,000 people to drug overdoses. Now, some of them in the cities, some of them in the suburbs, some of them are in the country. You know, this is not a thing that discriminates by ideology or race. We've lost 38,000 people last year. And by the way, the, the, the death by drug overdose is highest ever, I think. That's Certainly right. highest in years. Death by guns, handgun violence. 38,000, some of them in cities, some of them in suburbs, some of them on the farms. Um, the pain is the same. And, and it's our job to stitch that back together, turn that pain into purpose. Whether it's a farmer, God forbid, whose kid is addicted to opioids, or it's a mom in the inner city, it's the same pain. And so I, I'm looking for ways to stitch them back together. I don't think we should be at war, cities against suburbs, against countries. Let's talk about rural America. I mean, you mentioned earlier that Willie Nelson enjoyed that chapter. I also enjoyed that chapter. I learned a, a few things about, as you refer to them, the, the men from Nebraska. Um, why is it important that we reach out to rural America? Well, first, it's intrinsically important. We're Democrats. We love and we care. Um, it, 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 that's number one. Number two, I do think their, their pain and their problems are very, very similar. And we can, uh, not, not all of them, but we can get some of them to look past their divisions and, and to find common cause with us. Um, third, there's just a practical political science matter, which is the Senate is rigged. The United States Senate, with or without the filibuster, is rigged against big states. That was the compromise they made to create our country. But when they made it, Virginia had the most people. Delaware had the least. The difference was 12, 12 and a half times. Virginia was 12 and a half times the population of Delaware. Well, you know what the gap is now between California and Wyoming? 64. Wow. Mm -hmm. 64. There's only 600,000 people in the whole state of Wyoming, and they get two senators. There's 600,000 people right now stuck on traffic on the 405. We don't have a senator for the 405 in LA. So the Senate is rigged. It's rigged, but it means we have to win in places like West Virginia. Both President Obama's health care bill and President Clinton's economic plan, their two most important domestic accomplishments, were put over the top by Democratic senators from Nebraska. 
right. Bob Kerry in Clinton's case and Ben Nelson in Obama's case. So we have to win in place like that if we want to run the country. I agree with you. Let's discuss the issues that might defeat Donald Trump in, in 2020. Uh, you mentioned in the book, Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid. Um, why those issues? Again, we fell into the trap. The, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security are always essential. In a pandemic, they're existential. We take that away from people and they will die. And it turns out Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security are disproportionately helping Trump voters. I think it's great. <laughs> I want Trump voters to be living a dignified retirement and to be able to have health care. But Trump has proposed a $2 trillion cut in mm -hmm. Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. His last two budgets, well, excuse me, two. His last two budgets did that. And Democrats haven't broken through with that, I think, because of this diversion that we talked about. So if you just tell people, even Trump voters, Trump proposed twice in a row cutting $2 trillion from Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, which is the same amount that he took from us to give to corporate America. He's paying for his corporate tax cut by cutting grandma's Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. Now, we have him. I know he'll lie. He'll say I didn't do it. He'll say Joe did it like he did with Hillary. He accused Hillary of cutting Medicare. But we have him on tape. He went to Davos, Switzerland, and told all the billionaires there that he couldn't wait to cut. I don't have the quote in front of me, but he, that he would cut that. He went on Fox News and said he would cut Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. Uh, and it's in his budget. So I, I think we ought to just hang that around his neck. It, we, I, I say in the book, people should set their watch for every 10 minutes and say, you know, uh, boy, it's, it's terrible the Astros cheated in a World Series. And Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, Trump's trying to cut them. Or like, you'd be surprised, Donna, but I've become a big fan of Lizzo. I got young kids, the boys, I love Lizzo. Yeah. And Trump wants to cut Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. <laughs> yeah. Anything you're talking about, just throw it in. So Paul, um, let, me, let me just ask you about uh, healthcare. You, you, you also talked about healthcare in the book. Uh, President Trump proposed a couple of weeks ago that he was gonna come up with a healthcare plan. <laughs> in your book, you, you said we need to hammer Donald Trump on cutting, taking away healthcare. Explain why. Well, this is why Nancy Pelosi speaker again. This is why 41 districts who had Republican congressmen voted them out and put Democrats in because we are the party of health care. And I, I'm, you know, somebody told me this, Donna. I don't know if this has been public, but I know it's true. Someone who was in the room said when President Obama met with President-elect Trump, one of the things, how, how big hearted is this? One of the things President Obama said is, just take my name off Obamacare. Keep the program. It's helping your people. It's helping everybody. Just take my name off it and make it Trump care. It doesn't matter. We just want to help people. What a big hearted thing. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> of course, Trump didn't listen. He should have. Now that President Obama's gone, Obamacare has never been more popular. The joke I say to my right wing friends is, well, yeah, Obama's gone. So it's not Obamacare now. It's just care. And that's what we need. Democrats need to run on that. Mr. Trump is in court as we speak asking the right-wing judges that he's appointed to throw out the entire Affordable Care Act, which would take 27 million people, throw them out of health care, and take 129 million Americans and make them vulnerable again to insurance companies jacking up their rates or canceling their coverage because they have a pre-existing condition. Pre-existing condition, by the way, as you know, Donna, has been, has been actually, insurance companies have used being a woman as a pre-existing condition. Yes. So we're, you know, we're really in trouble if we let Trump do that. We have to tell people that. Again, we get so distracted by he's picked a Twitter war, you know, with 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 Rosie O'Donnell that we don't come back to the the, the people's lives. Hey, uh, Paul, in the book you have a chapter. It's still the economy, stupid. <laughs> I love that chapter. I had to read it twice, chapter ten. <laughs> but you pointed out that uh, the president is constantly trying to paint a rosy picture of the economy pre-COVID and that Democrats have to get back on top of the economy. Yeah. Why is that? Uh, and I think Joe did last week. I thought that Build Back Better plan was terrific. I thought the speech was terrific. What I want Democrats to do is put that Trump tax cut on trial. President Obama came in and the entire world economy was destroyed. And he built it back with $832 billion. 832. Trump comes in and the economy's chugging along just fine and corporate profits are at an all-time high. What does he do? He cuts taxes for corporations by 2 trillion. He spends more than twice the amount of money, our money, 
on bailing out corporations that have record profits than Obama did saving the whole global economy. So we ought to put that on trial. I loved that. My favorite line in that speech of Joe's was when he said, when Joe Biden is president, the days of Amazon paying zero taxes are over. Right. <laughs> I love Amazon. They're a great American company. But by golly, why should my little two person firm, which is just my wife and me, why should we pay more in taxes than the wealthiest man on earth? It's crazy. Right. Democrats should put that on trial. Um, it, it, it is it is just what Clinton would call a bird's nest on the ground, just like reach down and pick it up. Yeah, as you all know, one of the strategies uh, for defeating Joe Biden is to paint him as a pseudo Marxist, uh, of being taken over by the, the left, the radical left of the Democratic Party. How can we counter that narrative? Yeah, first, it's, it's hard to make that stick with Joe. He is middle class Joe from Scranton. Um, and he's got a, 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 a long record of writing the mainstream of the Democratic Party. And so they do. They want to put the squad on trial. Oh, they just happen to be women of color, Don. It has nothing to do with that. <laughs> you know? So, I of know. course, they always, they always go there. I don't think that dog will hunt. I think, for example, I thought Vice President did a great thing right away at the jump when he said, well, no, no, we're not defunding the police. So did Congresswoman Karen Bass. She she wrote the 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 new uh, uh, it's, it's the secure police act. What's it called? A George uh, Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Justice and Police Act. She wrote that bill. It does not defund the cops, and she's the first to tell you that. It right. redirects so that social workers can do social work, and policemen can and women can do police work. Um, so I think b both Vice President Biden uh, on the national level, and also Congresswoman Bass, who is rumored to be up for the ticket. Uh, I think she did a terrific job of turning that. You just can't let them get any traction with it. Um, and 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 I, I actually, you know, me, I always want to jujitsu and turn and say, well, actually, socialism is defined as the government giving things to people. And there's probably no bigger welfare queen in American history than Donald J. Trump. He's taking more money from the government and he's doing it every day today. He's overcharging the Secret Service for golf carts and for stays at his dopey resort. So I think I think it's that you, you have to deflect, but then you have to turn and put the the the, the attack back on the Trump. Um, before we get to some of the questions, and I see them filling up right now, and I'm I'm going to make this quick. Uh, you tell Democrats how to run on the issues, mm -hmm. uh, and you added some ingredients, and I just want to put them out there: personalize, humanize, and localize. Why is that? Amen. I, I think a lot of Democrats, you know, they're intellectuals. I'm not. I'm a proud Texas Longhorn Your LSU Tiger. I think that's an advantage. I have a lot of friends who went to Harvard, Yale, Princeton. They're great. But I think it's an advantage. It's what, what they used to say back home when I was a kid is put the jam on the lower shelf, but little folks can reach it. Right? Is that we have to meet, as Senator Mikulski used to say, meet people where they live. And so when we talk about abstractions, we talk about Section 8 housing. Okay, that doesn't, as George W. Bush would say, that doesn't resonate with anybody. Okay, but when Cori Bush says, I was homeless and I've been able to live the American dream and now get elected likely to Congress, that personalizes it, it humanizes it. And I think it's absolutely essential. We talk about programs too much and people too little. And, and I do think actually this is a Biden strength. He's very good about, even though he's been a legislator all his life, he's very good about remembering this about people. And, and th this is a people business we're in. And, it's, it's, it's far better to tell one story about one person than it is to give a whole statistic about a government program. Well, give us an example. Let's talk about climate change. Why is that important? You also yeah. address that in your book. I do. And as Donna, as I told you before we went on, my mama is watching this. She's part of this <laughs> Zoom. And Hi, I, was talk, I was talking to mom and she pointed out that the lake where her grandfather, now my Mother is, is uh, uh, still young, but her grandfather, 100 years ago, had a cabin in a, in a place called Lake Hopatcong, New Jersey. So I looked it up. Lake Hopatcong, her grandfather was an ice man. They would cut ice in the winter out of that lake, take it in refrigerated cars into New York City and, and sell it to people. That's, it, it, so that's, that was his job. That lake today, I looked it up. Global warming has gotten so bad that the ice doesn't form. It used to be two feet thick. So that 100 years ago, my great grandfather could go to that lake, take two foot of ice and go sell it in New York City. Today, you can't even skate on it. 
because it's so hot. And in the summers, when my mother used to go to Camp Tikawitha up there and swam in this beautiful lake, today you can't swim in it. You can't skate on it in the winter because it doesn't freeze. You can't swim in it in the summer because it gets this horrible algae, toxic algae, which would kill your dog and really do terrible yeah. damage to you. I, I tell a story of a woman in Austin who let her dog go swim in Ladybird Lake, which is right in the middle of Austin. The dog died from this toxic algae. So when you tell it in personal terms, like my mother can't swim in the, in the lake where she grew up, right? The, this, this woman in Austin who I learned about, her dog died because he fetched a stick at a ladybird lake. I think that tells people a lot more than just giving them the, you know, the, 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 the global science. In the stats, I, I agree with you on that. Uh, I know you are a great student of political science. What Senate races are you following and why? Man, all of them. All of them. Did you see today, Donna? Did you see the Quinnipiac poll today? South Carolina. Jamie Harrison, yes. Oh my gosh. My, my friend and colleague on the DNC. Yes. Jamie Harrison. Yeah. No finer person. 44 44. 44 44 tied. If you go from Lindsey Grant to Jamie Harrison, you're going to get the bends. Okay. You're going to go from one of the more loathsome creatures who's ever slimed his way through Congress to Jamie, who's a really terrific person. Uh, and he is in a dead heat in South by God, Carolina. Absolutely. So I, I care desperately, about. I, I've been in touch with all of them. You know, I can't, I don't know about you, but my deal with CNN is I can no longer work for politicians, but I can volunteer. So I've been burning up the Zoom lines, doing fundraisers and campaigning for all these candidates. I've got a cut, but MJ Hagar is very close to my heart, being a Texan. Right. MJ is a badass Texas woman who rides a motorcycle, reminds me of Ann Richards. Can we turn Texas blue? Yes, yes. Absolutely. Today, oh. NBC, a rival network to yours and mine, yeah. says Texas is a toss-up state. Oh. Texas. J John Cornyn's favorable is 36, Donna. He is highly vulnerable. 36. 36. And MJ, do you know her personal story? I don't know. I, I, I knew her opponent oh. in the primary, but I, I don't know her very she, well. Yeah, Royce is an old friend of mine, too. Royce and, is a good friend. I, I love Royce. MJ, she was a pilot in the Army, rescuing wounded soldiers in Afghanistan. So a, a soldier gets wounded. She gets the call. She flies in on her helicopter. Helicopter gets shot down. MJ gets shot. She's bleeding out. They send another chopper in. They rescue the wounded soldier. They rescue MJ. As they're lifting off, the terrorists, the Taliban start firing again. You know what MJ Hagar did? Bleeding? What? Strapped herself to the skid and returned fire. Wow. She That's is a badass Texas woman. So I yeah. love that race. I would even watch Al Gross up in Alaska. Mm. Al Gross is an independent, likely to caucus with the Democrats. But he's a, he's a doctor, but he's a commercial fisherman. And I think Senator Sullivan is very vulnerable, like Cornyn is. He hadn't really done anything. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, even Al Gross, even Alaska, I mean, we're talking about winning in places like Texas, South Carolina, Montana, where Steve Bullock is in a dead heat. Great guy. So I, I, we have really good candidates in really unlikely places. And I think this could be a really good year uh, for Senate Democrats. I know when you wrote this book, uh, you uh, indicated that Donald Trump has appointed over 112 uh, uh, judges to the federal courts. It's over 200. How is Trump using the courts to uh, hurt the average worker? You addressed that in the book. Yeah, it is. There are two long range things. Now, I can't wait to see Trump gone. And I want, I, want it, I want a fumigation and an exorcism before Joe moves in. But a lot of it, he can change right away. But a lot of it, he can't. And the two long-term things are climate, which we already talked about, which we're set back decades now by this man's pollution, but also the courts. He has stacked the federal judiciary with young, ultra-right-wing lawyers, most of them out of this pressure group, the Federalist Society, with which you're very familiar. Very familiar. They're going to be there for years and years. And it, it, it just breaks my heart. I tell the story of Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, the two most famous judges that, uh, that Trump has put out there. And it, it's just shameful. It's really shameful. Um, and this is going to take years and years to sort of rehabilitate the federal courts. Um, and, and, and by the way, I, I know Trump didn't appoint him, but I still carry no brief for Thief Justice Roberts. I'm sorry, I know we're all supposed to be nice because he ruled on choice and LGBTQ stuff once or twice. John Roberts gutted the Voting Rights Act for which our friend John Lewis shed his blood. He gutted it. And we are suffering from that. 
every day. He took away the key protection in the Voting Rights Act, the most important legislation of my lifetime. And now because that's been gutted, you hit people like Brian Kemp and others, Republican governor of Georgia, who are manipulating the system to disadvantage people of color, exactly why we created the Voting Rights Act in the first place. And, and by the way, Paul, as you well know, today is the 55th anniversary of the signing of the Voting Rights Act by a fellow Texan, uh, Lyndon uh, Baines Johnson. Uh, let me take some of the questions. You got a book? I do. I'll show you one thing, Donna. I pulled this out oh. when Mr. Lewis was buried. I went and I was so honored. I stood two and a half hours in line just to walk past the Capitol. He was up at the top of the stairs. We couldn't even touch the coffin because of COVID. But you loved him and I loved him. And so I pulled this book out. Now, I he gave it to me in 1998. He gave it to me on July 27th, 1998, almost to the day wow. when, when we lost him. And you know what he wrote? What? What's that? With faith and hope, keep your eyes on the prize. Mm. And you know what? That's, I treasure that. And the prize for him was voting. The prize for him was voting rights. And, and I, I, I miss him desperately. I miss him, especially now that voting rights are at risk. But I know this, I know he, he, he left us happy and really actually happy, thrilled with how young people have taken up the torch and how young people are working for voting rights. And you've been central to that, Donna. Well, it's one of my passions. And Paul, we have several questions that have come in. And one question is along that line about uh, voter suppression. How do we combat voter suppression in the 2020 election? Well, uh, look at what I, I, taught, I tell the story about what Stacey Abrams did. You know, she, uh, she lost by less than the amount of votes that were purged. And she was running against the sitting secretary of state who was manipulating that purge. I, I don't know what I would have done, but there's a great likelihood I would have just like moved to Alaska and gone fishing. Stacy decided not to get bitter, but to get better, right? She created this group, Fair Fight. She's working her heart out in Georgia, which has now got two Senate seats at stake and could be a swing state in the presidential. But also she's helping in Texas. She's help so we have to organize around the suppression. Okay, we have to, people should go, everybody, tell your friends, your neighbors, your kids, your parents, vote.org, you can check your status. Because they might be purging you, you don't know. Right. Vote.org, you can check your status. That's first. Second, vote early, vote by mail, vote absentee if it's allowed in your state. It's completely safe, completely secure. The Brennan Center, where our friend Michael Waldman runs, the Brennan right. Center for Justice at NYU ran the numbers in Colorado, which is 100% vote by mail. The fraud rate is, get this, 0 0.0000001. That is hmm. one ten millionth of a percent. Hmm. So it's perfectly safe. But, but so I think we have to be vigilant. We have to insist on paper. Speaker Pelosi has been great about this and she's pushing, pushing still in this negotiation now to make sure that the, the, the postal service is funded. But there's another idea. You know, LaVora Barnes, our great party chair in Michigan, yes. talking to her about this and David Pepper, the party chair in Ohio. They're advocating, in addition to vote by mail, drop boxes. Just put a drop box at the, at the police station, the government center, the firehouse. You can secure it so you don't have to use the mail. Okay, if you're worried about the postal system being overwhelmed, and we should be, a lot of places, and I, and I know Lavora is working on this and others, you can drop that thing in a secure box. You don't even have to give it to But to the, the president post. said that a child could put his or her hand in the box and okay. steal them. Can't, can't put a hand in an ATM machine. And I believe if they could figure it out for an ATM, they could figure it out for a ballot box. Okay. One of the other questions is how do we counteract Russian interference and uh, yeah. Russian interference in this election? As you well know, uh, there's talk that the Russians may be at it again. Why not? It was a successful playbook in 2016. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on how do we counteract this? Well, you, you were a victim of that crime, Donna. Uh, and it was the most successful foreign intelligence operation on U.S. soil. And Senator McCain called it an act of war. This is one of my quibbles with the media. They call it meddling. No, meddling is like when your neighbor comes over for dinner and she looks in your medicine cabinet. Okay, that's meddling. This was an invasion. In fact, I quote General Mark Hurtling, a four-star general who was in command of Europe and the forces looking to counter Russia. General Hurtling has written about this too. He calls it akin to 9-11 or Pearl Harbor. And he knows what he's talking about. He's a four-star retired general. So we have got to be engaged. First off, our defenses are better. 
because of what you went through and, and, and everybody, John Podesta, everybody went through. So our, our defenses are better first, but they're going to do different things. In fact, in the book, I predict, and I hope I'm wrong, but I think I'm right. They're going to use deep fake videos this time. There's technology that didn't exist four years ago that can make a video. You know, Jordan Peele does this with President Obama and it's hilarious, but we can tell that that's a fake. They're going to create videos that look like Joe Biden or maybe his son or somebody saying or doing some awful thing that's completely fake. We have to be on guard against that. And some of this is a, a bit of a character test, um, frankly, for the media. Will they fall for it? I think their defenses and guards need to be up as well. And I, and I think they are. But we, we've got to be uh, aware that this is still going on and not just dismiss it as meddling. Sally Yates, the former assistant attorney general, testified this week. And she said, it's ongoing. It's going on still. And I'm, I'm quite sure she's right. Uh, one of the uh, questions I have here refers to Professor Alan Lickman, 13 mm -hmm. Keys, in his uh, presentation in the New York Times yesterday. Is he the Notre Dame of presidential electoral politics? I saw that and I like Alan. The key is you. The key is you. The key is voting. Nobody knows. And it really is. It's incumbent on all of us who work in these vineyards, but also incumbent on folks to engage and vote. We had in 2018 the highest midterm turnout in 100 years, the highest turnout since women got the right to vote because Nancy Pelosi and her team engaged folks. They, but also folks engaged us. There's a groundswell out there. But I, I, I read Alan's stuff, and he's a really good guy. He's a really smart guy. I am less sort of uh, deterministic, right? I think it's really in our hands. And uh, folks in 2018 decided they wanted Democrats to take over the House, and so they did it. I think, I think they're ready to fire this guy. And, but it's totally up to them and up to those of us whose jobs it has been or is now to motivate them. Paul, this is a wonky question and I can't help you with the answer. So let's see if we, uh, we can do this. Besides explaining that Trump has proposed Medicare, Medicaid and social security cuts, Democrats need to explain that had the GOP health plan passed, mm -hmm. that people with pre-existing conditions would have been in high risk pools and paying premiums up to $10,000 per right. month as they did pre-ACA. Um, when I explained this to my friends who are cancer survivors, they were horrified. What are your thoughts on this? It's 100% right. And this is one of the lies the Republicans tell. They say, oh, I, want, I don't want people with pre-existing conditions to lose their coverage. But what they don't say is what this uh, viewer knows, which is, yeah, they, they'll put you in a high-risk pool and charge you $10,000. That's not insurance. That's highway robbery. And it, it is, it, we are all at risk. 129 million people under the age of 65. Of course, Medicare, you're in no matter pre-existing condition. Thank God and thank Linda Johnson. But for those of us who are below 65, we would be subject again. And right. as you age, every, we know this because we're aging. As you age, the likelihood of you getting a pre-existing condition goes up to about 85% by the time you turn right. 60, 65. Because life happens, right? It's fine when you're 25. <laughs> but yeah. life is a pre-existing condition. It is completely at risk. And these Republicans, it's not just Trump. He's in there. But the Republican Attorney General of Texas, Ken Paxton, he's in court. A bunch of Republican attorneys general around the country are in court trying to take away health care from decent taxpaying Americans, who, by the way, pay the taxes that provide Ken Paxton his health care. But he doesn't want you to have it. Uh, Paul, in the book, uh, you address many issues, but you did not address uh, racism and police brutality and gun violence. Um, why is that? Yeah, I didn't have a separate chapter on it. It's marbled throughout the whole thing. I, I do think that, that the BLM movement has been just absolutely essential. It's been, and it's, it's had a big impact on me, you know, as a middle-aged white guy. Um, and so I think it's been enormously important and useful, but I do talk all through the book. Correct. Um, gosh, if you look at, at even after Obamacare, if you look at health insurance, I put this in the book, it's about 5% of white people who are uninsured. It's about 9.5% of African-Americans. It's about 20% of Latinos. So there is still 
structural systemic racism. Uh, I, perhaps I should have done a chapter on it, but, but I, I think actually that conversation, I, I love being a part of it, but I think it's got to be led you know, by communities of color. But I, I tried to shine a light on some of the good work that lots of people are doing in there. Um, I got some more questions. Uh, should Biden debate 45, Absolutely. the best liar and dis distract in the history of the, uh, of the world? Should, uh, should Biden participate in all three of those debates? 100%. 100%. Hillary wiped the floor with him in the debates. She won every debate by uh, around 60-30 in the polls. She wiped the floor with that guy. And he hasn't gotten better in four years. He's gotten worse. Look, let's just be honest. Just Trump, I, he's like a glacier. You look at him, he's very slowly melting. But then once in a while, a glacier calves. <clears throat> and a whole sheet of ice falls off. And he's having a calf every day every day so he's melting down that's why he says that joe is is not competent because he he sees his own i think uh ineptitude and and i think absolutely 100 joe has to debate and i think he'll wipe the floor with this guy uh, another question how do you assess the strengths and weaknesses of the potential vp candidates i like them all <laughs> i like them all uh, I, I will say We've had 48 vice presidents. So far, my people, white men, we're doing all right. We're actually 48 for 48. That's we're correct. batting a thousand. <laughs> so just to even it up, right? We would have to have nothing but women as vice presidents until the year 2,251. Wow. That would then, then we'd be even. Then we'd be even. Half the country, half the country. Half the country men, half the country women. So I think it's wonderful that Joe has, has committed to uh, nominating a woman. Because again, as we said earlier, when you expand the, op the, the, the circle of opportunity, you expand the talent pool that you get in. Um, the, all the names that they've mentioned, I probably know most of them, some of them very well. Um, they're all terrific. I don't mean to be weaselly, but I also know that Vice President Biden has had that job. And I believe he's gonna choose the person he thinks, first, most important, God forbid something happens. But then second, God willing, who will be my governing partner the way he was for Barack Obama? And he knows that role better than anybody. I don't know where that leads him. And I bet you, knowing Joe, and you've known him a long time, that the, um, the, the, the interview, the personal connection, right. that's going to matter a lot. It did for President Clinton. He's Governor Clinton then. It wasn't until he sat down with Al Gore. And by the time Gore wasn't even down the hall, and he's like, that's, he was just done. They had a chemistry which they had no idea they would have. They weren't close before. So, right. so I don't know. But I think these names that they're mentioning are just phenomenal. They're terrific. Um, I want to bring up something that right before we started talking about your amazing book. I noticed that the word Catholic is trending. We're both Catholics. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it's trending is uh, this is what the president said. He said, Joe Biden will hurt the Bible, <laughs> hurt God. This is a direct quote, Paul. Uh, he's against God. It's trended. That's what I mean. He's melting a, a down. This is a member of St. Joseph uh, Catholic Church in Greenville, Delaware. Uh, Joe Biden, who I've uh, gone to mass with. Joe Biden, who is a practicing Catholic, a devoted Catholic, a faithful man. The president said today, Joe Biden will hurt the Bible, hurt God. He's against God. Ah. It's amazing. It, he projects. I, I, look, I never took freshman psychology, so I shouldn't try to diagnose this man. But it seems to me that he always accuses others of what he knows in his heart he's guilty of. Remember in that third debate, well, one of the debates, Hillary said, absolute truth, she tried to warn us. Hillary said, Putin wants you, he's intervening in our election to help you because he wants to have a puppet in the presidency. Remember he said, no puppet, no puppet, you're a puppet. <laughs> yeah, but that's just nonsensical. Yeah. So, I don't, I can't see into his heart and uh, uh, I, so I can't judge his faith. But when he questioned something, remember he questioned Dr. Ben Carson's faith. I remember. Who is a powerfully devout Christian. So he does this, I think, when he knows that perhaps um, people of faith can see in Joe a, a kindred spirit, as they did in Dr. Carson. Um, it's reprehensible. And by the way, how do you hurt God? I had I got into this with Joe Lockhart, the Georgetown man, a fellow Catholic. He's like, how do you hurt God? And I said, well, 
sin. And there are yeah. seven deadly sins, right? And the seven deadly sins are, I, I'll get, I'll lose some of them, but they're greed, sloth. Um, um, oh gosh, what are the rest? I, I got to look them up. But if you list the seven deadly sins, you basically get a, a description of Donald J. Trump. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and speaking of Donald Trump, and by the way, what I loved in your book, every chapter you you uh, gave us another word for the J. <laughs> I did. Jade, it, jaundice. I mean, thank you for that. That was wonderful. <laughs> I never thought of that until I got to like the fifth chapter. <laughs> uh, I love that. Many believe that Trump will, will refuse to leave the White House even yeah. if he loses. What should we do to prevent prepare for this eventuality. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I give credit to him in the book. Bill Maher was the first to raise this. And, uh, you know, he's, he knows Trump and, and he said he'll never leave. And I think he's right. I think this is the first time in American history we have an incumbent president and we are reasonably, reasonable people are concerned that he will not relinquish power. We've never had that before, right? So what do we do? First off, it's a little unfair, but it means that Joe has to win by more. He's got to win by so much that they can't steal it, which is why I want him to target Texas. I want him to target Georgia. I want him to target Arizona. I want him to target North Carolina. States that we haven't won in a generation. Right. I mean, we've only won Arizona once since Roosevelt, I think. Maybe, maybe uh, true. Yeah. Uh, but, but we can win it. Joe can win it. So I, I, it's not fair. You know, you and I, we always knew 270 was it. And there are no bonus points for getting 370. That's right. You cross that goal line, but this is different. I, Joe needs to not only cross the goal line, he needs to go through the end zone in a locker room and out to the parking lot and fire up the bus. He's got to win by so much. So that's on us, right? Uh, um, and then it, it's going to be tremendous pressure on Republicans in the Senate and, you know, you, you, and in the House. Um, you couldn't find a spine in the Republican Senate, uh, except for Mitt Romney if you had an MRI and a CAT scan and electron microscope, but they're going to have to, to, to grow up uh, and, and call him on this. Um, if we win by a lot, that, that, that will make a big difference, but I am terribly worried about that. The book, You're Fired, The Perfect Guide to Beating Donald Trump. Paul, number 15, uh, chapter 15 was one of my best chapters, and um, this is one chapter that I will recommend to my students. You've got to serve somebody. Tell us about that. Um, you know, I, I was privileged to work for President Clinton, and uh, when he was in the Oval Office with George H.W. Bush as president-elect, and President Bush was president, this is what President Bush said to him. I really hope you'll keep the Points of Light Foundation and uh, Points of Light program. And uh, President Clinton said, I guarantee you, I give you my word. In fact, I think you'll like what we do with it. So he expanded that. President Bush created Points of Light. It was wonderful. He, Clinton expanded that with AmeriCorps. Uh, President Bush sustained it, and then President Obama expanded again with the Edward M. Kennedy Serve America Act. So this is in the finest bipartisan tradition of Americans. But still, even after 25 years, there are 75,000 people in AmeriCorps. 75,000. They do wonderful things. But there are 45 million young people between the ages of 20 and 30. And I bet their unemployment rate's 40%. So they need jobs. They need the dignity of work. They need the skills you get at work. They need help to pay for education. So what I'm proposing is that we throw open the doors of national service to any person who wants to serve their country. You know, the Marine Corps is not for everybody and Peace Corps is not for everybody, but AmeriCorps can be for everybody. If you're willing to serve, we need a COVID Corps, Corps. we need a Seniors Corps, we need people to tutor young people who maybe don't have access to the technology that we have and can't do the distance learning during a, a pandemic. The, the national parks have a backlog of $12 billion of repairs that these folks could do. There's, the, the need is endless. Young people, you teach at Georgetown, so do I. The young people, this is, a, this is the second greatest generation. Second time we've produced the greatest generation. I think these young people are phenomenal. They'll save us all. Let's give them that chance. Um, so I'm a huge, huge believer in this. And Chris Coons of Delaware, who has the Senate seat Joe Biden once held, has introduced a bill with a bunch of Republican co-sponsors to take AmeriCorps from that 75,000 to a million. And I call that a good start. And it is something I think it should be a signature issue for Joe Biden in this campaign. Well, before we, we leave, um, Paul, you uh, in, in the last chapter, you, you talked about um, 
why Trump is in it for himself mm. and why it's important for us to make this about us, make it about the American people. And your closing comments, why should we make it about us and not about just President Trump? Well, when I was writing it, I reflected on this terrific novel about Afghanistan called The Kite Runner. It's a huge hit. In The Kite Runner, the father says to the son, son, the only real sin is stealing. Everything else is a variant of stealing. You steal, you kill someone, you steal their life, right? You cheat on your wife, you steal your, her, her pledge of fidelity. I don't agree with that. I think it's an interesting book, but I believe every sin is selfishness. And that every sin, every crime is a, a variation on selfishness. And in his Nobel Prize speech, Dr. King said, what self-centered men, he used the language of his day, what self-centered men have done wrong, other centered men can set right. Well, other centered women and men can set this right. And to me, that, that also encapsulates this choice. Donald Trump is, if nothing else, a narcissist. He is all about himself. He has no core principles, none. He only cares about himself. He's, he's like the, the tenor in the opera before the curtain goes up. He just me, 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 me. Joe Biden is the most empathetic person I know. His suffering has bred such empathy and such compassion. It is exactly what the difference. This is exactly what Dr. King was talking about. And I take such inspiration from that because I, it's like he was analyzing the election today. Right. What self-centered men have done wrong, other centered men can set right. That's a, that's a choice in this election. Well, Paul, I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, Diane, your lovely wife, my thank sister. You. Of course, I want to thank uh, your beautiful sons, Billy, John, Patrick, and Charlie. <laughs> am I right? Yes. So, uh, And they're all registered, you. and there are three of them are working for Democrats. <laughs> Absolutely. And what about who graduated from law school? Billy? No, nobody's in law school yet. We, I got three out of Nobody. college, and then Patrick's still in. Patrick's still in. Well, my niece just graduated from law school and oh she's accepted a clerkship in Texas. So treat her, treat her right. Oh, well, we'll take First good care First lawyer in the Brazil family. We're oh, happy. Congratulations. The book is Your Five, The Perfect Guide to Beating Donald Trump. Paul, this was a great read. Uh, you finally got me away from Netflix and Prime. This was, <laughs> uh, I enjoyed all of the how-to and I want to recommend all my friends, whether you're working in the Biden campaign, working on the Senate or congressional race, this is the book. If you're just a political junkie like Paul and I, political strategist, please buy the book. Paul, you're an amazing soul. I miss you, my friend. God bless you and your family. Thank you for being a part of this program. Donna, thanks. I love you. God bless. Love you hey, too. Paul and Donna, thank you both so much for uh, being with us tonight. What a great conversation. I'm just going to add to what Donna said. You don't have to be a, even a political junkie. You should just read the book because it's a great book. Paul has a lot to say and we all need to learn from him. Uh, Donna, thank you also. You're always such an inspiration. You always uh, impart a lot of wisdom on the rest of us. You guys are great. Like I said, a hallelujah moment for us to have both of you. Um, I hope you both stay well. I hope all the audience members, you know, be safe, be well, be well read. Um, and as both Donna and Paul have admonished us over and over again, everybody's got to vote. We got to all get out to the polls in November and help uh, elect uh, the, the candidates who are going to get this country back on track. So thank you both so much. What an honor for us and be well. Thank be you. Well. Listen, thank you, politics thank you. and prose. Thank you all.